On April 11th of 2019, SpaceX had their second launch of the Falcon Heavy launch vehicle. And on top of the Falcon Heavy was a communication satellite called Arabsat 6A. So in this video, I'm going to be going over what the launch was like, what went successful, and why they ended up choosing a Falcon Heavy over a Falcon 9. So let's talk about that. So let's begin this video with a recap of what took place on the actual launch. First of all, the Falcon Heavy successfully lifted off from the launch pad and continued to accelerate or go up until max Q. Now max Q, if you aren't familiar with, is actually the maximum dynamic pressure experienced by the vehicle. And now that explanation might not make sense, but overall it's basically where the maximum loads are applied to the vehicle. So where it's going to be under the most stress. So from a structural standpoint, if it passes the max Q point, then it's gonna most likely be successful. But there are other things that can still come into play. However, the Falcon Heavy continued on its trajectory until the two side boosters came off first. They run out of fuel first, so they came back and headed towards Cape Canaveral to land, whereas the center booster continued to push the upper stage a little bit longer until it too separated. The second stage ignited and continued on its path into orbit, whereas the center core stage started to come back towards its drone ship. Now this drone ship is about 950 kilometers downrange from Cape Canaveral, which means it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So this is going to have to try and land on this barge much like many of the other Falcon 9 vehicles have done before. However, because of the launch profile itself, the two side boosters came back down to Cape Canaveral and landed before the center booster did, and the two side boosters did successfully land as you see now. But if you continue to watch, a lot of people were skeptical about whether or not the center booster could successfully land. And this is because this isn't like a normal Falcon 9 booster. It has to be modified to be able to hold the structural loads of having two boosters on the side of it. Therefore, it's kind of like this intermediate booster that hasn't necessarily been landed before. If you recall in the first Falcon Heavy flight, it didn't successfully land. In fact, it crashed into the ocean. So they weren't 100% sure whether or not this would actually land on the drone ship. However, after a few minutes, they did get the feedback and it did successfully land. So that was pretty exciting for SpaceX to be able to recover all three boosters on this launch. However, the second stage continued to take it into its orbit and then finally its geostationary transfer orbit. Now altogether, this launch was a major success for SpaceX. Not only did they get the communication satellite to the nominal orbit, but they were also able to recover all three boosters, which was pretty incredible. But there's something interesting about this launch, and in my last video where I talked about Arabsat 6A, or the payload for this mission, a lot of people commented below that a Falcon Heavy wouldn't be required for such a mission. So I decided to do some investigation, and it turns out they were correct. If you look at it, a Falcon 9 or a fully expendable Falcon 9, which means they can't save the booster, it just crashes in the ocean, can take up to 8,300 kilograms to a geostationary transfer orbit, whereas this communication satellite only weighed 6,000 kilograms. So why would they need a Falcon Heavy? And this is really interesting because there are two main reasons why they ended up using a Falcon Heavy. One of them being a financial reason and the other one being a technical reason. And that's what I'm going to focus the remainder on this video, discussing why the Falcon Heavy over the Falcon 9. Now first of all, and probably the most obvious reason, is just the financial one. It turns out that it cost around 60 to 70 million dollars to launch a Falcon 9, but that's for a reusable launch. It's not quite sure how much it would cost for an expendable Falcon 9. 
Falcon 9. Some people estimate it could be anywhere from 90 to 100 million dollars. And remember, as I mentioned before, an expendable Falcon 9 is one where they can't save the booster. It uses up basically all the fuel that the vehicle has. So a reusable one is much cheaper. However, a reusable Falcon 9 wouldn't be able to launch this mission. So the price tag using a Falcon 9 for this payload would cost anywhere from 90 to 100 million dollars. Then if you look at the Falcon Heavy, it's estimated that a fully reusable Falcon Heavy costs around 90 million dollars. So it turns out you can actually get a stronger vehicle for a, about the same price as a fully expendable Falcon 9. So this is basically a win-win situation for both Arabsat and SpaceX. SpaceX because they're able to reuse their boosters if they successfully land them, and Arabsat is because they get a lot more energy for the same budget that they would be able to supply. Now again, this is based on the estimates that the Falcon 9 is going to cost about 90 to 100 million dollars if it's fully expendable. But a lot of people say that's a pretty good guess. And since SpaceX is trying to reuse a lot more of their Block 5 versions, they could probably expect it to be a higher price tag than normal. So now let's go on to the technical aspect of things. If we think about it from a payload perspective or the people that are building the satellite, once they get into space, they wanna to have to use the least amount of fuel to be able to get into their final orbit. And this is because the more fuel they have once they get there, the longer the lifespan of the vehicle can be, whether they have to do station keeping or making sure their orbit is in the right place. This is basically more fuel. So the more fuel they can save, the longer the mission will most likely last, unless something else goes wrong. But more than likely, more fuel means longer duration, which means more use of this vehicle. So altogether, why would they want to use a Falcon Heavy? Can they actually save fuel using one of these? And while I was watching the live stream, I noticed that one of the broadcasters mentioned the orbit that it's going to, and it was very briefly. He said it was a geostationary transfer orbit with an apogee of 90,000 kilometers. But that number stood out to me, because a typical geostationary transfer orbit doesn't have an apogee of 90,000 kilometers. It has an apogee of around 42,000 kilometers. Now what does all of that mean? Let me give you a rundown of what that looks like. Here is the Earth and this circle around it is representing the final orbit for Arabsat, which is a geostationary orbit. Now I discussed this a lot in the last video, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth of what this scenario looks like. Now a typical geostationary transfer orbit looks like this. It's a elliptical-like orbit that has a perigee or the closest distance is pretty close to Earth and the apogee is really close to the altitude of the final orbit, which makes sense, right? If you're starting at Earth and trying to get to this larger circle, you would want to go basically on this trajectory. But now let's overlay this SpaceX orbit or where the Falcon Heavy was taking Arabsat. That looks kind of weird, doesn't it? I mean, it seems like they're overshooting the orbit by basically twice as much as they want to. Now, after seeing this orbit, a lot of questions came to mind. What benefit does this give Arabsat 6A? Does this give them more time in sunlight so they can use their solar panels? Are they actually able to conserve fuel at this higher apogee? Because no matter what, they have to end up going to this geostationary transfer orbit. So how do they get there and what does it look like? Now I quickly ran through some calculations and don't worry, I'm not going to show any of those equations or numbers to you, but rather I wanted to explain the procedure from a more straightforward understanding or if you aren't familiar with orbital mechanics, what exactly is going on or how spacecraft are able to go from one orbit to another. Like how do they go from this ellipse to this circle? What do they have to do? And the first thing we need to understand is they're able to maneuver from one orbit to another by applying a force or an acceleration to the vehicle as a whole. When this acceleration is applied, they're able to change their speed, and when they change the speed or velocity of the spacecraft, they're able to change the orbit. So how do we apply this force or this acceleration to the spacecraft when it's in space? And this is by turning on our thrusters or the engines. Now, if you continue to watch the SpaceX live stream, it's probably like 40 or 50 minutes long. And the launch and landings take place over maybe five to 10 minutes. But if you continue watching until the end of the live stream, you'll see that SpaceX turns their engines 
back on. And this is to change their orbit from their initial low Earth orbit to the final geostationary transfer orbit, or this really weird elliptical one that we see. But you might be raising the question, why would they want to do that? If they want to get to this final orbit, don't they just float over there? And in fact, orbital mechanics is very tricky. Where you go or what orientation or orbit you're in depends a lot on the velocity that you're traveling at. So as I mentioned, if you apply thrusters, you could change your velocity and then change your orbit. So at the end of the day, what you have to do in order to change your orbit is to turn on your engines, which means using more fuel. So how much fuel does this new orbit save Arabsat 6A rather than just having to go to a normal geostationary transfer orbit? So let's first explain the case of the normal geostationary transfer orbit. In a normal GTO, the spacecraft will wait until it gets to apogee or the furthest distance from Earth, and then it will burn its engines until the orbit is circular. And this process takes a delta V or a change of velocity of about 1.47 kilometers per second. So that's quite a bit of energy, but that's pretty typical or pretty normal for anyone that wants to go into a geostationary orbit. So now let's look at the Arabsat orbit and see what procedure they probably have to follow. Once they get to Apogee, they're going to have to turn on their engines and perform a burn that gives them a delta V of 0.55 kilometers per second, which is a lot less than the 1.47 kilometers per second that was needed for the typical GTO. However, that's not the only maneuver they need. As you can tell, they're still not in this perfect circular orbit. They still have this one aspect that is way beyond, the one that's the 90,000 kilometers away. So when they get back down to the orbit, they actually have to slow themselves down. They have to slow themselves down by 0.86 kilometers per second. So when you add these two maneuvers together, this ends up being 1.41 kilometers per second which is a little bit less than the normal maneuver or what is usually used for a geostationary satellite. However, it's not that big of a difference. So why would they want to do this? Now, they might not be saving a lot of fuel in this case. However, there's another major aspect that we're not considering. We live in a three-dimensional world. These orbits are also three-dimensional. And ideally, Arabsat 6A is probably going to want to be very close to the equator. However, these normal orbits are very rarely like this. In fact, this is called inclination, or how much the orbit is inclined. And typically, for a launch from Cape Canaveral, it's going to be inclined by about 28 degrees. So it also is going to have to apply a maneuver or change its velocity to make it such that it will have a zero inclination. Inclination. And this can actually take a lot of fuel, sometimes almost as much as the amount of fuel it takes to get to the geostationary orbit. So if we also take this into account when we consider how much energy or how much fuel the spacecraft is going to need, the larger orbit or the one that goes all the way out to 90,000 kilometers is going to be a lot more beneficial. And this is because when it's all the way out there, it is a lot easier to change its inclination than rather it's closer to Earth. So what ends up happening when you introduce this new larger orbit, Arabsat is able to save up to 25% of the amount of fuel that it would need in order to perform these maneuvers or to get into the final orbit. And as I mentioned way back in the video, the more fuel they're able to save, the longer the duration of the mission or the longer they're able to operate the satellite as long as everything goes well. So it's basically saying using this larger orbit that the Falcon Heavy put them in was very beneficial to what actually they wanted to do in the long run. So overall, we learned that a Falcon 9 actually would have been able to send a geostationary satellite of this mass to a geostationary transfer orbit. However, it would have been expendable and it wouldn't have been able to send it to the same orbit the Falcon Heavy was able to, which means from both a financial and technical reason, the Falcon Heavy was the better vehicle in this case. And because of that, I expect to see a lot more geostationary satellites being launched on a Falcon Heavy, just because it's able to save up to 20 to 20 25% of the fuel that they need in order to get to their final orbit, which is a pretty big deal. Now with all that being said, I wanted to ask you, what did you think about the Falcon Heavy launch, and are you excited for more of these launches to come up in the future? Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.